Distinguished future physicians, welcome to Stump on Step 1, the only free video series that helps you study more efficiently by focusing on the highest yield material. In this video, we're going to be covering confounding, randomization, blinding, and certain types of bias. This is the seventh video in the Biostat section, so I suggest you check out the rest of these when you're done with this video. You can see here I give sampling slash selection bias a high yield rating of 2. For those of you that don't know what that is, it's a rating scale from 1 to 10 that gives you a rough estimate on how important each topic is for step 1. If you want to learn more about that, you can head to my website. Sampling bias or selection bias, the two are very similar. If you really want to dive into the minutia, they are different, but for the purposes of step 1, you can use both terms pretty similarly, so I'm just going to sort of give you a general definition for both of them. But in both cases, you're going to have a selection of the sample from the overall population that is not random. That results in low generalizability, low external validity, because your study population is different than the overall population. An example that's very common would be when study participants volunteer for a study. In this case, those who choose to volunteer for a study are likely different than those who choose not to volunteer for a study. Another example would be your recruitment method. Consider you're recruiting only via the internet. In that case, you wouldn't get any patients who don't have the internet. So you could be missing out on a lot of rural locations or people from lower socioeconomic levels, in which case your sample wouldn't be really representative of the population overall. Confounding is when the study results are distorted by some factor other than the variable being studied. In this case, it appears that there's a relationship between the exposure and the health outcome based on the results, but there really isn't. There's really some other factor that's causing the results to look like this. Confounder is a characteristic that's common to the exposure and the health outcome. The reason confounding is so bad is that an unwise researcher may incorrectly come to a conclusion there's, that there's a causal relationship between the two things when there really isn't. So you need to identify it and correct for it or try to eliminate it altogether if you're going to try to make associations between a risk factor and an outcome or a treatment and an outcome. When you don't identify that a confounder is present, it looks something like this. You think that risk factor A leads to health outcome B, or treatment A leads to health outcome B. But here's what's really happening. A happens to be associated with C, and C happens to be associated with B. If you remove C, there is no relationship between A and B. Consider you are doing a clinical trial for a new treatment, and the average age of the treatment group is 75, and the average age of the placebo group is 25. At the end of the study, if you just look at the results, it looks like the treatment leads to less negative health outcomes. But is that really what's going on? It's probably just the result that the treatment group is much younger than the placebo group, and being younger on its own is associated with better health. Obviously when you're creating a study you want the different groups to be similar with regard to things like age, gender, race slash ethnicity, and socioeconomic factors. Those are some things that are known to have a big impact on a lot of disease processes. But you also want the groups to be similar with regard to other confounders, maybe things you haven't even identified as being important to the disease process. Consider some specific behavior is found, you know, 10 years after your study to be really important in the disease process. You want your study to have similar numbers of people in each group with that specific behavior. So you might be wondering, how could you possibly make groups similar with regard to some factor that you don't even know is important? And the way you do that is through randomization. Randomization is just the process of selecting from a group in a fashion that makes all possibilities equally likely to be selected. Imagine you have a deck of cards. Now if you take the deck straight out of the box and pick off the top card, what you're getting is not a randomized selection. That could be a brand new box of cards, in which case the cards are going to be ordered in a specific fashion, and the top card may be the joker or the highest card. Or you could have just played a game like Solitaire that 
puts the cards in some sort of distinct order. In either of those cases, whatever you pick off the top is not going to be a random selection. It's going to be more likely to be certain cards than other cards. However, if you take the deck of cards out and shuffle really well, then the odds of selecting any one card are all the same. In research studies, randomization is sort of like shuffling the, the patients before you assign them to the different groups. And when you do this, you have an equal chance of each patient ending up in the different groups. When done correctly, randomization will lead to comparable groups with regard to known and unknown confounders. There is one caveat that randomization does not work as well with small sample sizes. This is because when you break it down, randomization is based on laws of probability. And when you have a much smaller sample size, chance plays a much larger role in determining the makeup of each group. So this is like flipping a coin 10 times. More often than not, you'll get a similar number of heads and tails, but there could be one fluke time where you get eight heads. Now, if you're going to flip a coin 10,000 times, you're much more likely to get a very similar number of heads and tails. So that's why having a study group with 10 patients is not going to work as well. There are a lot of different ways of assigning patients to groups that might appear random at first, but when you break them down, they aren't randomization and they're going to create bias. When there's not proper randomization, you're going to end up with baseline differences between groups, and this baseline difference could end up confounding the results you have. So here are some examples of things that aren't proper randomization methods. So if you're allowing patients to choose which group they want to be in based on personal preference, that's not randomization. If you're basing it on severity of disease, say putting the people in the best health or the worst health in one group over the other, that's not randomization either. Other things like the day of the week, which might seem somewhat random, are not. Consider you assign all patients that come in on Thursday to one group and all patients that come in on Saturday to another group. It might appear random, but it really isn't. You're not necessarily going to get similar types of patients on each day. For example, on the weekends, you might get a different patient population that has access to transportation. Different bus routes aren't as common during the weekend, so maybe you're not going to get those patient populations. Additionally, during the week, you're probably going to get more unemployed patients because it's harder for people to get out of work. And another example would be basing group assignment on whichever doctor or provider the patient has. So you can't just say Dr. A is the treatment group, Dr. B is the placebo. That, again, isn't random because the patient populations for each provider are not going to be the same. There's going to be certain factors that affect that. More often than not, randomization will work fine on its own. If you have a big enough sample size, the laws of probabilities dictate that the two groups or the three groups or how many other groups you have are going to end up being similar to any specific characteristic. However, that's not always the case. Chance can still come into play, especially if the sample size isn't that large. Now, if you know a particular factor is extremely important for your disease outcome, say you're studying an X-linked genetic disease, you know the gender of the participants is very important. In this case, you don't want to take the chance that the two groups could be different with regard to this factor. In this case, you do something called stratification. And stratification is basically randomization that's guaranteed to be balanced with regard to one particular factor. So first you just divide the population by a particular characteristic and then you randomize those subgroups. Here is the normal way of randomization. If you start with 100 patients, you would give 50 to the treatment group and 50 to the placebo. It's not always the exact numbers of teenage group, but just follow along with me here. In this case, when you're just randomizing everybody together, you have an unknown gender mix that ends up in each group. More often than not, than not it'll be 25, 25, or something similar, 23, 27, whatever. You're going to get your groups that's similar. But if you don't want chance to determine that makeup, then you do stratification. In this case, you'll first break up the 100 participants into men and women, and then you randomize from there. So 25 men will get the treatment group, and 25 men will get the placebo. And then you repeat this with women. So now in this case, you have an exact same gender makeup in both, gr both groups. We talked about randomization. That's the main way to make sure the different groups are similar at the beginning of the study, but making sure the groups remain similar throughout the study, except for whatever factor you're trying to isolate, is also important. 
blinding is the process of hiding which group a particular patient is in. You need to do this because if a patient knows which group they're in, that could very much affect the outcome of the study. If the patient knows they're getting the placebo, they might be less compliant or less likely to stay to the end of the study. Or knowing they're getting the placebo may give them additional stress. This would cause a change in outcome just based on that. So at that point, you're not sure if the treatment is causing the problem or if the added stress from knowing they're not getting a regular treatment is causing the observed outcomes. But the patients are not the only people that need to be blinded. In a good study, you'll have double or triple blinding. Double blinding would be when the patient and their provider is blinded. And sometimes you'll hear the term triple blinding. That means the patient the provider and additional researchers, maybe you know data analyzers, they're also blinded. Now you want these providers and analyzers to be blinded because they could treat the different groups differently through the course of the study and that different treatment could be a confounder if it's present. For example, the providers might feel compelled to prescribe additional treatments to the group receiving placebo, in which case that additional treatment might add bias or the researchers could really want to show a difference with their treatment. So maybe they'll spend more time with the patients receiving the treatment. And finally, the last reason that it's important to blind providers and researchers is because if they know which group the patient is in, they could accidentally tip off the patient to what group they're in. The key to blinding in a treatment study is a placebo, which is just a drug without the active ingredient that closely mimics the actual treatment. For example, if the treatment is a pill, the placebo will also be a pill that's virtually the exact same size, shape, and color so that the patients and the providers can't tell the difference. You wanna make it so even a trained eye has a very difficult time distinguishing between the placebo and the actual drug. Basically, you just need to know that the placebo is given to the control group and it's a way of giving them no drug without them knowing. A crossover study is when the participants switch groups partway through the study. Most often you'll see this in treatment studies where one group starts on the placebo and then after a certain period of time switches to the treatment group, usually about halfway through the study. The other group will start getting the treatment and then will get the placebo during the second half of the study. In these crossover studies, there isn't a separate control group as participants act as their own control so what you end up doing is controlling the patient's outcomes during the time they had the treatment to the time they had the placebo.